soy el líder representando la Sierra Nevada de los cuatro pueblos. Nosotros los indígenas tenemos un acuerdo espiritual con la naturaleza. Es convivir con aguas, convivir con tierras, convivir con piedra, convivir con los ríos, convivir con los animales. Nosotros antiguamente, antes de la conquista, conquistas de, de, de las colonias, vivimos un territorio colectivo que hoy a privatizar se nos convierte a nosotros como un problema. Nosotros tenemos una estrategia de dejar 70% para la conservación de cuenca hídrica, del bosque, del aire, toda la integralidad y el 30% para los usos eh, agrícolas para sostener a la familia. Por eso cuando hablan, digamos, del gobierno nacional o internacional que los indígenas se encuentran en la última pobreza de extremas, yo creo que es un, una expresión que nos golpea. Nosotros no somos, tenemos aguas, tenemos alimentos, tenemos aire puro, alimentos naturales 100%. Los mamos, nuestros sabios decían, el mismo, el mismo agua va a hablar, el mismo la tierra va a hablar, el mismo aire habla, el mismo el, el, el sol va a hablar. La Sierra Nevada para nosotros consideramos un territorio sagrado. El territorio es nuestra madre, corazón del mundo. Hi everybody. Um, Hello. I just want to ask yeah. if everybody can hear me um, because my mom had said that our audio is not working. Um, so please let me know. Um, but I'll keep going. So that um, video is dedicated to the Kogi because they are, we're, that's one of the nations that the Amazon conservation team work with and they visit here in Six Nations. Um, to the Sour Springs Longhouse and and they were greeted by our chiefs and everybody shook their hand when they were in the Longhouse and right now they're suffering really bad because of COVID and they're taking it really hard so we wanted to um, dedicate this video to them but um, again, we want to introduce ourselves. I am Makasha Looking Horse. I'm one of the youth leaders for Oholoko, or not Oholoko, Oneganos um, Water is Life project that has been in Six Nations for the last three years. And um, I work with, I, I work with um, the scientists and I do all, all kinds of different things on here. And one of my responsibilities is to show because it's about community outreach. And so we want to make sure that you guys feel involved and make sure that um, you feel open to commenting any kind of questions anytime anybody is speaking. And this is my co-host Dexter. Uh, I'm Dexter Jimerson. Um... I'm one of the community members at Six Nations, been going to Longhouse my entire life, um, was raised actually in uh, Cattaraugus Indian territory. And I went to Longhouse at the, um, uh, 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 what the heck is that name again? Uh, Newtown, uh, that Newtown Longhouse there is the Seneca Longhouse, but that's where I was raised and I spent uh, some of my time out here as well in Six Nations going to Sour Springs Longhouse. And uh, that's basically where my mother is from. So I'm from Six Nations and this is my nation out here is Cayuga and I'm part of the Wolf Clan. 
and I'm just the co-host and I like to, you know, I like to help, you know, uh, my community get as much um, information and I try to help educate everyone uh, the same equally, but I really like to uh, educate our own people the most because they are the ones that suffer the most when they don't have um, the type of, um, I guess, the type of opportunities that most people like us have. But uh, I've been working at Guyana State for at least four years, and I was recently made the, uh, well, three years ago, I was made the uh, cultural interpreter there, and I was working in the old longhouse there. And uh, alongside uh, one of our guests uh, today, uh, Mr. Geardo Deer. But yeah, that's just a little bit about me. <laughs> yeah, so today's show is going to be super exciting because we have um, Amazon Conservation Team Rudo Kemper, and we have Ch my dad, Chief Orville Looking Horse, who is going to be talking after him. And then we have um, Geardo Deer, who is a cultural and I guess traditional ecological knowledge holder. And I think everybody knows him in Six Nations or mostly everybody. Um, he's worked at Guyana Say for a really long time. Um, and hopefully he'll be able to join us after. And then after that, I'll be talking about um, our virtual reality that we have been working on and um, what that looks like. And we have a few videos that we can show you. But um, firstly, we like to, um, um, we like, well, I like to let everybody know what the circumstances are on here in Six Nations. And I don't know if everybody who is viewing this knows that they are, um, are land, they're land defenders that have a blockade up at the local development and people are defending the land and that the land legally belongs to Six Nations. And um, we have a Confederacy letter here that we would like to show you. And so the letter states that they are, um, that the Confederacy is backing up what is happening in um, Six Nations with the blockade because um, there was a lot of people who are um, I can't see it. Yeah, you can't see it too well. That the Confederacy is backing up what is happening in um, Six Nations with the blockade because Okay, it says we trust this finds you in good health and good spirits. As you are aware, a number of steps have recently been taken by the Haudenosaunee people to protect our lands, rights, and interests, which has included the lawful use, occupation, and possession of our lands by our people on the proposed Mackenzie Meadows residential development site. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council is opposed to this development, and as the holder of collective rights for the Haudenosaunee people, has not granted any type of consent which would allow this development to proceed. This development is proceeding in our red zone, which clearly sets out there, uh, there will be a development uh, moratorium within his area. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council has a process for granting consent in this area and it has not been followed on this development. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council supports and thanks our people and our, and our allies who are taking peaceful steps to protect and save the land for our future generations who will, have, who will have nowhere to live and prosper if the settler population continues to unlawfully encroach upon our lands. We are once again calling on the governments of Prime Minister Trudeau and Premier Ford to sit down in good faith and return, the, return to the negotiation table to address land issues with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council. We deeply hope to avoid repeating the events of 2006, which involved the reclamation of, uh, I can't read that word, Kanosata 
Tom. Is that right? Ganosutatom. Where after many years of discussion, negotiation, and moving towards a resolution, the federal government simply walked away from the negotiation table. We know that this issue will not be resolved by the use of injunctions which escalate matters with the attempt of to with the attempt to impose Canadian law and criminalize our people for simply asking that the Crown honor its treaty com uh, commitments. This matter will be resolved when the Crown begins to properly understand that it is the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council which holds rights collectively on behalf of the Haudenosaunee. Bodies and entities have a role when they have been delegated by the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Chiefs Council, however, the respect and recognition that forms our treaty re relationship with the Crown most must first be extended by the Crown to our people through their government, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council. This request is made respectfully where we know that Canada has made similar agreements with other nations where Confederacy chiefs still govern. August 15th, 2020. Sorry, I had to read that so close. Yeah, so this is an issue that is, is hundreds of years hundreds old. of years old. And so it's it keeps happening again and happening, happening. And even today and year 2020, um, we are still having the issue of um, basically trying to exist on our own land, which was, you know, um, taken away from us such a long time ago. And it was all because um, the Canadian government thought we weren't using the land correctly. And they said that uh, they would uh, sell it in behests of uh, the Six Nations and we still have, you know, they sold it on us and we still have um, barely any um, uh, money from that. We, we don't have no money from it. We, we don't live uh, prosperitively like how a lot of people think that we do, you know, like we just have all this money, but we don't live like that. We have no money from that. Um, they allowed all these settlers to come in and take over this land which was once ours that was promised to us a long time ago. And that's the reason why we have all these different guests on uh, every week is to showcase all of their traditional um, knowledge and to showcase that people are still having to go through these issues hundreds of years later. And today's guests are involved in a lot of that traditional ecological knowledge. And um, the like Rudo, um, Makasha's father, and my cousin, uh, Girdo. We've all been doing the uh, same exact things. We've um, just been educating people on the land rights, the land issues, and a lot of what's uh, current events as well. So we go through a history, we go through a wide span of uh, history that uh, starts before uh, colonial colonialism and all the way up to um, recent as yesterday. So traditional ecological knowledge is a knowledge of ecosystems. Well, the indigenous knowledge of ecosystems it is an understanding of the interconnection of humans and the environment and is defined differently depending on its application to resource and ecosystem management, natural law governance, empirical observation, human health, and can you go back one more slide, please? Yeah, so um, our all of our speakers that are here today, including what um, our project does is, is all traditional ecological knowledge led. And um, and that's a lot about a lot of work that Rudo does and how I met and Rudo, how I met Rudo. Well, we have a long relationship with the Amazon conservation team because they've been to Six Nations um, years and years and years ago. And I've known Liliana since I was a very little girl. And she is, um, she's like, she's one of the leading people who lead <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> I don't know her definite title, but um, 
you can see here how like old these pictures are. So you can definitely tell how old I've known her for. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I definitely knew her for a long time. And my parents uh, went out to the Amazon and they and my father, he went out to the Amazon um, and they went out there for um, traditional medicine, I think. And um, we have definitely like a, a long history of how we worked with the Amazon conservation team because we went out there a long time ago. Um, we went to, um, I seen them at the United Nations and we've met with them and they're on our grants and so is my father and then how the Lakota and the Amazon conservation team are connected is because the Amazon conservation team is working with the Lakota um, and helping them with their maps and they met here um, in these pictures and you can see that we um, supported them when they were at the United Nations. And you can see that one of the elders here on the bottom um, left corner, they're holding up a Mohawk and um, the Haudenosaunee um, sign there, flag. And then there's Bev Jacobs. So we all work together and the helping our communities in the best way that we can. The Goanio students also went to the ACT office. Um, they also met with my grandfather, too, who was a uh, hereditary chief at Onondaga Longhouse. And they gave him um, this uh, gift of uh, this, um, I think it was like a headband. Well, that's what he wore it as, and he was always really ridiculous. But uh, uh, he was once a hereditary chief, and he was a great man. But should you introduce... Uh, our first guest. Yeah, so our next guest is Rudo Kemper. Um, I uh, met him when I was in, at the United Nations, and he has a lot of knowledge. and He's trying and he's working with the Lakota, and he also came here and met with um, Cleve Thomas, I think, and um, our chiefs here and showed showed them what we could do here potentially in Six Nations. So I want to um, think it's be interesting to hear a little bit about what your work because it's really cool and what you're doing. Hi everyone. I'm uh, really happy and excited to be on the on the podcast today with you to share with you a little bit about the work uh, that we're doing in South America uh, with indigenous communities around traditional ecological knowledge and also kind of how we've been sharing our experiences. It's uh, very exciting for me uh, to be here to, and think back up to about a year ago, actually a year and some months ago when I was able to visit um, Six Nations and really kind of share about some of the work that we're doing and, and sort of try to create the connections or really cultivate the connections, right? That go back actually to when you were young, Makasha, um, when you were able to visit the Jingu in Brazil with Liliana and with your mother. And I'm really excited and kind of honored to be uh, continuing to cultivate those connections. So I'm really happy to be on today. Yeah, I'm happy that you are on with us today. Um, we have, I think it'll be so exciting for what you have to share with the community. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you on here. Thank you, Dexter. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> So I think uh, one of the first things that I wanted to do um, is to sort of share a message of hope that comes from the Amazon uh, that was shared with us by um, Mama Narcisa, who is from the Asomi um, Association, which is an association of indigenous women that are working to reclaim their land and protect it and to ensure that it re remains sacred. And so we have a message that we want to share with you, which is about two minutes long. And then afterward, um, Makasha, I would ask you if you'd be willing to read the translation um, from Mama Maxisa. So if we can play that video, we can start with that. Awesome. Habitantes aquí, reunidas los días 6 y 7 de octubre de 2018 en la Casa del Pensamiento Mama Junapa Iriay Alpa del municipio de Mocoa, 
departamento de Putumayo, atendiendo el llamado de la Madre Tierra, actuando en el marco del mandato, ejemplo y sabiduría dejada por nuestras sabias y sabios del conocimiento ancestral para la defensa y cuidado del territorio. Con fundamento en el derecho propio, ley de origen, pensamiento y cosmovisión de nuestros pueblos. Considerando que la Madre Tierra es quien nos prevé la vida, asimismo es un ser vivo, siente, piensa, se manifiesta. Entendiendo la necesidad de concientizarnos y construir mecanismos para la defensa del territorio. Asumiendo nuestra corresponsabilidad en el cuidado de la vida y la pervivencia de los pueblos originarios. Pensando que la paz no puede construirse alejada de la defensa y protección del territorio, el agua y el bosque. Si el territorio y el agua es la vida para nuestros pueblos, la paz depende necesariamente de ello. Recordando el rol que tenemos las mujeres en nuestras comunidades y territorios, garantes de la vida, la transmisión del conocimiento, la lengua, la cultura, la medicina, las artesanías, la educación propia. Considerando que nuestro cuerpo es el primer territorio que debe estar libre de violencia, de amenaza y riesgo. Amparadas en los derechos reconocidos en el Convenio 169 de 1989 de la OIT, en la Constitución Política de 1989. All right, so um, that video cut out a little bit shorter than it was supposed to, but what she's saying, um, and I'll read the translation, it says, Mama, Mama Narcisa, Narcisa. Narcisa, talking about the creation of ASOMI, Indigenous Reserve for the Protection of Sacred Plants. The ASOMI is an associate, association of Indigenous women who are working to conserve their ancestral territory um, in the Puerto Mayo region of Colombia. Their mission is to revitalize the knowledge and protection practices of Indigenous communities regarding traditional um, medicinal plants, artisanship, <laughs> artisanship, artisanship, women's self-care and ecological stewardship of their territory. They're responding to the call of the Mother Earth acting on our mandate to put into action and the wisdom left behind by keepers of ancestral knowledge for defense of our territories jointly with our own rights, law, our own laws of origin, ways of knowing and worldview of our people. Considering that our Mother Earth, who gives us life at the same time, she is a living being who feels, who thinks, and who knows herself. And understanding that, and understanding that of the need to aware, to raise awareness, to raise awareness and creating mechanisms for defending our territory, assuming the responsibility of taking care of the life and survival of the Aboriginal peoples with the understanding that our achieving peace can't be disjoined from the defense of territory, the water and the forest. If the lands and the water is life for our peoples by necessarily necessity, 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 peace depends on both, recalling the role that women play in our communities and territories, guarantee Tearing, guaranteeing. guaranteeing life, the transmission of knowledge, our languages, our culture, our medicine, 
Um, <laughs> one second. Our medicine and our own systems of education, considering that our territory should be free of violence, of threat, and of risk. Yes. So that's awesome words that she just said. Yeah, I agree totally with Mama Narc Narcissia. Mama Narcissia. Narcissa. Mama Narcissa from uh, Putumayo, Colombia. Yeah, I thought that was a, just a really beautiful message to start us off with, you know, because there's a lot, obviously, of tragedy right now in the Amazon um, with what's happening with the video that was shown at the beginning of the programming. But it's important to also re remain hopeful, right? And to, and to really uplift the voices that give us hope. So I wanted to really start with that and bring you that from the Amazon that was shared with me. And I wanted to share that with you to get us started. And um, what I thought I would do is I wanted to share with you a little bit about what's going on in the Amazon right now. Um, I'm sure you know about what happened last year with the fires and then also with COVID-19. So I just wanted to give a little bit of information. Um, I know that the elders of Six Nations are very concerned as well. And I know that they've been in council meeting about what's happening in the Amazon. So I wanted to share a little bit. So let me see if I can get that going. All right, do you see my slides? Some stuff on the screen? All right, let me see. Yep, we see your slides. Great. And also just sort of, the, another thing that I really would like to start with um, is sort of a visual image, you know, like um, an aerial photo of the Amazon. This is a Matawai village in uh, Suriname in a part of the Amazon that's really sort of near and dear to my heart, um, where I've spent over five years working with the community to map their lands and record their oral histories. And this was a beautiful shot that was taken at around six in the morning. So you can still see a lot of morning fog over the trees. So again, starting with good vibes and a beautiful picture of the Amazon um, to really get us started in talking. Um, but obviously there's also a lot of tragedy, you know, ongoing in the Amazon. And before we talk about, you know, what's the subject matter of today, which is uh, traditional ecological knowledge, so I wanted to give you a bit of an update. So, as you know, last year there was a series of um, devastating fires that were raging across the Amazon that really got the world paying attention to how the biggest rainforest was being destroyed at a rapid scale. And like everyone at ACT, at the Amazon Conservation Team, we were really shocked when it started to happen. And everybody at ACT was working around the clock to get a grasp on what was happening, to make sure that our sort of friends and family and the partner communities in the Amazon were doing okay and trying to get aid um, as it was needed as fast as possible. We were also flooded by outreach, by media requests, and also calls of solidarity from our allies, including, as I mentioned, from the elders um, in Six Nations. And we're super grateful for all the moral and spiritual um, support that we received. So um, eventually when the fire started to subside, uh, the truth started to come out on how the fires happened. And a lot of the research showed that most of the areas that, that were caught on fire were actually cut down beforehand. So there was deforestation that took place before there were fires. And some of those areas were, that were set on fire uh, went out of control. And there were others that were affected by increased droughts. So climate change was a factor there and they caught on fire eventually. So we really learned that what was going on in the, what, what happened last year wasn't an anomaly because there had already been this sort of increase of deforestation in the Amazon and cutting of trees. And so we really learned that it wasn't something new. It was just something that kind of was heightened because of the intensity of the deforestation and then also the climate change. So it's basically the same fight that we've always been fighting, right, which is against um, people that are encroaching onto the forest, onto indigenous lands that are um, causing deforestation and extracting from those lands. So it's the same fight that um, we all have been fighting. What happened this year, um, unfortunately, it's looking pretty bad as well. Um, you see here a chart that shows 2019 and the previous years where there was a real increase of deforestation. And then also now what's happening in 2020 showing that there's actually been kind of an increase um, in spite of or taking place because of the, the COVID-19 pandemic that I'll talk about a little bit later as well. 
So that's what's really worrying us right now is that the data is showing an increase of deforestation. And so consequently, we could face an equally devastating fire season. So this is something that we're really monitoring very <coughs> with our partners on the ground. Um, because we want to ensure that the fire season this year is not going to be as severe as it was last year. And also working with our uh, with the partner communities, the indigenous people in the Amazon to make sure that they're prepared, that if it does happen again, that they have knowledge and awareness and know how to prevent it if it does approach onto their lands. Another thing that's kind of worrying is so in Brazil, um, the government officially proclaimed a ban on fires uh, for the summer in order to prevent um, the extremity that happened last year. But one thing that that doesn't prevent from happening is kind of the illegal deforestation and a lot of the illegal felling of trees and fires that have been set. So even though the government is trying to bring it under control, it's still concerning to us. And so um, what we're doing now as ACT is we're trying to do what we can to respond to the fires. So initially, um, a lot of our response for the communities focused on relief and just getting humanitarian aid and helping communities rebuild and supporting indigenous people's organizations that were working across the Amazon. But now we're also putting a big focus on future preparedness and resilience so that the communities are ready to face these kinds of crises um, when they happen again, if they happen again. Of course, the other sort of twin crisis that's happening right now has been the spread of uh, coronavirus, of COVID-19, which is unfolding in real time across the Amazon. And so um, here we have a map that was produced yesterday um, by an organization called Rafam, which is showing the extent of um, the communities that have been affected by positive cases of COVID-19. You can see that it's really spread all across the Amazon at this point. Um, close to 45,000 indigenous people have been recorded positive for COVID-19 and close to 1,500 people have perished from it. It may not sound like a lot, but a lot of communities are very small, even with less than 100, you know, um, the population less than 100 and even just a few deaths can be really devastating. So um, a number of our indigenous leaders have already lost their lives to COVID-19, including some of our friends and allies. So as you saw in the ceremony, in the dedication video this morning, um, when we started off, this is the governor, Jose de los Santos, who is um, a Kogi, who is a Kogi leader who dedicated his life to defending the rights of indigenous communities of the Sierra Nevada, the Santa Marta in Colombia. Um, and again, he's um, from the Kogi who actually have a longstanding relationship with the Haudenosaunee going back over a decade. So this is somebody um, that was a leader for that community who really fought very hard for the land rights and sort of rights to ancestral territory and sacred sites, who um, very sadly lost his life to COVID-19. And then another powerful leader from the Jingu was Aritana Yalawapati, who um, ACT knows from years back um, when we helped his community map their lands, which is another sort of loss. But there's also hope. Um, and this is really what I want to sort of emphasize. You know, this is a season that um, that is happening to the Amazon right now. And it's something that will pass. And there's also positives that we can emphasize. So I personally work with a community in South Suriname called the Trio, who have had a number of positive COVID-19 cases um, a few months ago. But the communities have pretty much, the, the people that were affected by it have um, pretty much all recovered because everybody has been taking a traditional medicine called Wataki. And so far everyone has recovered well. So now everybody in Suriname, all of the indigenous peoples are taking this medicine, which really shows you kind of the true value of traditional ecological knowledge and that ancestral knowledge that has value beyond just um, the, the knowledge of the landscape, but also healing and spiritual healing. So um, ACT as an organization, we're doing what we can to help with COVID-19. So we're you know, trying to offer humanitarian aid uh, translating materials to the indigenous languages about how to prevent COVID-19, about proper hygiene, about awareness of where it's currently located. And um, we're also supporting indigenous organizations and partnering with clinics. And so just like with the fires, um, the COVID-19 situation is teaching us that we need to help communities be prepared and resilient for future crises that could be on the horizon. 
Um, it's also showing us that the work that we're doing and that Onegonos is doing as well uh, to capture traditional knowledge is critical. So as we know, it's the elders that are the most affected by COVID-19 and there's a huge risk of the loss of ancestral knowledge, which uh, could be traditional ecological knowledge or it could be oral histories that teach the young people who they are as a people and how they are connected to their lands. And so it's really highlighting for us also the importance of doing the kind of work that we do as organizations around capturing, recording, and ensuring that the younger people have access to that ancestral knowledge, which is something that's going to give them that resilience um, that I mentioned. So this is something that ACT has been doing for a long time, actually, going back to some of the very first maps that ACT helped make with indigenous people representing ancestral knowledge of their lands. So um, over 20 years ago as an organization, the Amazon conservation team were working with um, indigenous people in the Amazon to make maps of their land um, in order to capture some of that traditional ecological knowledge that the communities um, had that goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years. So some of that knowledge is place names uh, that, of places that might have a spiritual or sacred significance. And I know that later on, we're going to hear from uh, Chief Orville Looking Horse, um, who's going to be sharing some stories about his, um, about sacred places in his landscape as well. And so it's the same thing in the Amazon. So there's a ton of really important places for the communities that have this kind of cultural significance and really shows the community members who they are as a people and how they are connected to the landscape. So this is something that ACT has been working on for the past 20 years in guidance with um, indigenous elders and under request from the community who when they realize that some of the younger people aren't learning about the traditional ecological knowledge or the historical knowledge about, the, um, about their lands as much as they used to. So there was a need to start documenting some of that knowledge so that um, the younger generations have access. So this is one way of doing that and that's mapping. And so that's taking a look at the landscape and sort of seeing where the places are and where the resources are, like where the medicinal plants are, uh, places where people go hunting um, and where they can find different uh, resources for the community. More recently, uh, something that we've been doing is recording the oral histories that the elders have. So we realized that just writing things down or mapping was not enough to capture the extent of that ancestral knowledge, um, especially as it pertains to oral histories about some of those uh, spiritual places that, that I talked about a little bit earlier. So what we've been starting to do is um, recording the elders as they share the oral histories about the different places in the indigenous, in the landscapes. So what we're doing as an organization in that process actually is working more with the younger people so training young people how to use um, video recording equipment and mapping equipment. And they are then the ones who interview the elders and ensure that the stories are being transmitted. So in so doing, you're kind of creating the ability for the younger people to learn right as the recording is happening, which is very exciting. And in that way, it's something that the community themselves is doing. And then we as an organization are more like the tool to make that happen and to give the trainings um, for the younger people to take over that process. So we started to do this in the Jingu actually, in which is um, a place where both Makasha and her mother have been, as well as the Chief Arpo Looking Horse uh, with a community called the Wauja. So we started to uh, do that work with video recording and then also mapping. So what we've recently been doing over the past three years is developing an application called Terra Stories which is essentially, it's an, it's an entirely free and open source application that's meant to, for mapping indigenous oral histories. So it's something that can uh, run without internet access as well. And it's something that um, allows communities both to document their knowledge and to share it, but then also to protect it because there's a way to restrict some of the oral histories and place names as I'll show um, a little bit later on. So we started to do this work with a number of different communities across the Amazon, including uh, the Wauja. And the way that it works is essentially you have maps that um, are designed by the communities that has their knowledge and ancestral knowledge of the landscape that you have on the right hand side. And then on the left hand side, you have different stories that are associated with um, places in the landscape. So it's a way to both um, 
enable communities to create custom maps of their land, as in the slide that I showed earlier, where you had uh, the gentleman that was holding up the paper map, um, as well as connecting the oral histories that are that might be connected to some of those places in the landscape. So you can either um, explore the map and sort of uh, zoom in and out and, and check out different places and then click on points to view stories about those places. Or you can uh, view the stories and then it travels and it sort of zooms in and takes you to the location on the map. And then from there you can full screen the stories and kind of check it out. Um, and this is all something that can work offline. And as I mentioned, another sort of nice aspect of it is that if you want to protect your knowledge, the, the, the software enables you to do that. What you can do is you can set stories as uh, protected so that you can only view them once you've logged into the system. So let's say that there's an instance of this with this application called Terra Stories, and it's set up for an indigenous community. There might be some stories that they want to share with a broader public or even within the community. And so when you open up the application, you see those stories, but then there's another set which is protected behind a login. So you can only view those once you logged into the application with the credentials that only you have access to. So this is a way that we're using to uh, restrict and protect some of that ancestral knowledge, which is not supposed to be shared um, with outsiders, and which is really just more for internal usage and the maintenance of the territory. Um, it's an application that's designed to be very fun and friendly uh, to work with kids. So um, it works on mobile as well. And we've um, worked with a number of communities that focus especially on the young people that are you know, in grade school. Uh, the teachers really like it because it's a way for them to learn computer skills and literacy, as well as a little bit of history and language and geography as well. So it's a great way to teach uh, young people about different things that are already in the primary school like computer literacy, but then it's focused really on the ancestral knowledge, right? So it's combining uh, that kind of learning together with uh, more traditional education. So um, we recorded this in a methodology that we've been starting to share over the past couple of years. And so as Makasha mentioned, I was lucky enough uh, to meet her and her mom a few years ago when the Amazon conservation team traveled to the uh, United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues where we got to meet, um, there were a number of other indigenous groups present as well. And we all got to sort of share about the different struggles in the different landscapes where we all work and realizing that there was a lot of connections between you know, what's going on in Six Nations and what's going on in the Amazon and how sometimes the struggles are kind of the same and the needs are very similar. So um, we started to share a little bit more actively since then, and I've been lucky to be kind of involved in some of that process together with uh, Liliana Madrigal, who is uh, the founder of the Amazon Conservation Team. And here's a picture of all of us that we took together at the UN Permanent Forum. Uh, Makasha, I think you're in there, as well as some other folks. And we started to talk a little bit more about Six Nations, right, and how we could do a similar kind of project um, really looking at the ancestral knowledge of the Haudenosaunee traditional lands. So just like in the Amazon, you know, the, the different Haudenosaunee communities ha also have their own kind of ancestral knowledge and traditional knowledge of the land. And this is a map that's kind of an example of that, where you have some place names of importance around the Grand River and other areas, um, which are place names that have stories attached to them that have a historical significance or even like a cosmological significance or just historical places. Maybe Giro can comment on a little bit, give us, give us an example on how that would work um, in Six Nations, maybe when he talks later later on. Yeah, he can give a lot of information. He, he likes to talk, that guy. Uh, but it's really a fascinating and amazing work that you're doing. I really like the uh, aspect that you have the it geared towards uh, children more because it helps uh, recognize the land more as a family member rather than it just being um, something that you use and you know and by something like you use you know um, all the time you know a lot of people see it as just something that's uh, for them and they usually abuse things like stuff like that so I really like that aspect of it and I find it really um, amazing you know I really like I find it fascinating. But uh, 
we yeah, do we, have we, a we definitely can like use it like in land claims yeah and we can use this as a tool to um reclaim our lands and I think it's really important to give our land the names that we um, that we traditionally given them. And so saying Mackenzie Creek, it could be a, a name that we had already come up with. And instead of saying like the Grand River, it could be the name that we um, came up with. And um, I think it's really important to have access to knowledge like how Brantford used to be a, there used to be a village there or stuff like that. Like, I think it's really important to know where our land, um, what it's called to us. And that knowledge is not really like, and especially in Six Nations community, it's not really accessible. Like we can't really access that knowledge if, especially if you're an urban, native living in Brantford or Hamilton and the surrounding cities like there's no way that you can access that knowledge easily like you can't really access an, an Elva or an Jock because they're so overworked already our traditional knowledge keepers are already so overworked and if we had something like this I think it's really important for people to have access to that kinds of knowledge that kind mm -hmm. of knowledge. That was uh, a lot of what we were, um, me and Gerda were doing at our work and people were coming to us, but we were also going to uh, the classes, you know, but we only went to um, the uh, schools that were locally, you know, that were in um, our reservation area. Like uh, we went to Gawanio a couple of times and we went to um, I.L. Thomas and Emily C. General. And me and my brother, we always um, went there and we did um, social dances and stuff like that and did protocol of uh, dances and stuff like that. But we, I would like to do more of like um, more traditional knowledge with those kids, those kids because they need to know it the most because our people will suffer the most if they don't have it. And um, what else was I going to say? Well, I like the I aspect. About what I was going to say. I like the aspect that you have. I think it's important to emphasize, especially in my community, that there's ways that you can restrict knowledge because there's a whole bunch of people who are always worried about oversharing knowledge and, or not oversharing, but like, how do we protect our sacred knowledge or our knowledge that is not supposed to be known to outsiders and things like that. And I think it's really important that you mentioned that it can be restricted to certain people and um, but yeah, it is important. I remember what I was going to say. Um, the word Canada, it's actually a mispronounced uh, Mohawk word, uh, Ganada, which means village. So um, when people say oh, I'm from Canada, they're um, mispronouncing a word from our own people, which is pronounced Ganada. And that means a village. So everybody that lives in Canada is uh, part of the village people, you know, YMCA and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, um, so do you want to tell us about like what kind of work the Amazon conser conservation team does? Does exactly and like how it came to be? Yeah, sure. No, and also even looking at this map, right, that's on the screen right now, you see that there's one name for Toronto, which I think uh, was also sort of a native name, Ateronto. Yeah, it's um, Tarondon, and uh -huh. it's a log in the water. And there's two stories, and we kind of figured out, like, a uh, practical use for those words as well. There's one story that uh, there used to be a big giant tree that was that had fallen down, and all of the uh, surrounding um, people knew about this uh, the street and they used it as a bridge. And that's where all these different people came together and they would use this bridge. And it was like a big um, trading sort of um, like um, uh, spot. And a lot of people would come through there. And the other word, it, well, the other reason is that they had these uh, different types of fishing weirs inside the water and they would line them up and it was this giant one. and 
uh, for the people at home that don't know what like a fishing weir is, um, it's basically a sort of like funneling system where they put sticks in the water and the fish, depending on what size type of fish you want, you would uh, make them smaller and smaller and smaller. And all you really do is go into these spots in that are in the water and they have um, different sizes for like minnows, um, bass, um, walleye, pike, and different other types like salmon and a lot of different uh, different types of fish that would come in from the ocean, from the rivers, and they would come into these lakes uh, utilizing the rivers and stuff like that. But that was uh, one of the reasons why they had that, um, that, that name, uh, which is just a log in the water, basically. And Gerdo has um, helped me um, uh, with a lot of that research as well. Uh, me and him sort of um, like spearheaded um, all of the uh, information that would go out of Guyana State. We sort of bottlenecked it, like how you have restrictions on your uh, information. We um, basically, like we were the ones that were deciding um, what people needed to know and what um, we could tell to every like uh, outsiders and what we would say to our uh, own people. And with our own people, we basically just had like all this information and we would just like shove it right down their throat. <laughs> and so like, it was just like all this information and basically um, the more information you give them, you know, they're basically gonna um, hear something and they're gonna latch onto something. So if um, they get one thing out of that, they can come back to us and we can elaborate more. But did you want to um, tell us a little bit about how you um, know Chief Orville Looking Horns? Uh, sure, yeah, no, and thank you so much, Dexter. That's so fascinating. And it's the kind of thing that probably most people don't know, right, about Toronto, even, even though it is an indigenous name. And then, of course, you have some of the other names on the map that have, that have only been given kind of settler names. And so those original names have been erased from the map, which is why it's so important, right? to produce maps like this and the ones that we've been producing in South America as well that sort of retain that traditional knowledge. In South America, when you zoom in on where the indigenous peoples are, you either see nothing, like on Google Maps, for example, or you see only colonial place names. And so a lot of knowledge has been taken off the map, which is why it's important to for us to make our own maps, right, and to help the communities make their own maps. Mm -hmm. exactly. We got started doing this as well and sort of exchanging with, um, with Six Nations and with other communities. And so, um, well, here's another example, right, of some maps um, of the kind of Haudenosaunee territory that we'll actually talk about a little bit later. So um, I think that's coming up, so we'll skip that a little bit. But so just to finish up that story of um, how we started to work together, right, is after the United Nations, when we all met, uh, we decided that it would be nice for Amazon conservation team to come up to Six Nations and to sort of share some of our experiences. And the, in terms of the mapping and how we've been doing this work and how we start usually working with communities and what are the different steps involved in producing maps that go into an application like Terra Stories, which has both these kinds of place name maps as well as oral histories. And so a year ago, um, a year and some months ago, we were able to go up there and I met with the Conegio School and we did a couple of trainings uh, focused on that. And we did this really exciting a workshop with the students there where the kids who are also keepers of knowledge. I mean, that's why I think your story is so beautiful, Dexter, because although we tend to think of the elders, it's younger people that also have knowledge of the lands, right? Like you two do and everyone does. And so everybody's involved in this sharing and this transmission from generation to generation. And so for us, it was really meaningful to also sit down with the kids at Six Nations, at Six Nations who then also drew out their knowledge of the lands and the Grand River and what is important to them and what kind of traditional ecological knowledge they have about the river, which you would be surprised. They are aware where the fish are, where there's plentiful fish, for example, because they go there with their parents to go fishing, right? So there's already that traditional knowledge that even younger people um, tend to have of their lands. So it's a collective process always. That's why we call it participatory mapping. And that's what ACT has always done for the past 20 years is to work with communities to basically to show them how to use tools so that they can do the mapping themselves. So um, very recently, we were part of a um, hackathon that was organized by uh, an organization called Geo Indigenous Alliance, where it's basically indigenous people worldwide that want to use maps for uh, their land reclamation purposes. 
And so there was a hackathon challenge that was posed by a gentleman from the Lakota, uh, the Sioux commun community from Rosebud Tribe, whose name was James Rattling Lee Jr. And he wanted to see, very interestingly as to like what I talked about earlier, how in North and South America, the needs tend to be very similar. Um, he wanted to see maps and an application that the younger Lakota people could utilize to hear stories in the Lakota language about their lands. And so I read that challenge and I said, oh, wow, that's Terra Stories. We're developing something very similar in South America. So I wanted to sort of share with him and the community to sort of show off what the application could do um, when it's utilized in the context of, of their ancestral landscape. So um, if we have time for it later, there's a video that I can show where basically we submitted a challenge um, where I basically, we didn't work with the community yet. I just created a demo of the application and sort of showed the Lakota lands and a few sample stories so that the community members can see what this application can do for them. But we could put the link for uh, the video. Sorry, go ahead. The, uh, we could put the link uh, for the video inside the description as well. Awesome. Yeah. But what I did for today actually is I prepared um, Terra stories with a little bit of stories from uh, the Lakota. So yesterday we actually had the occasion to meet with um, with Chief Arvo Looking Horse, where he shared us a few stories. And we also uh, did some creative mapping yesterday where we put a few of the Haudenosaunee uh, place names on the map. So just for to sort of wrap this part of the presentation up, and then I think we can have, have more of a conversation. I kind of wanted to show you uh, how the application works. So um, as you can see here, you can translate the language. And so I only know a few words in, uh, in Mohawk. And so one of those is to, to greet somebody, right? Which is correct my pronunciation if needed, uh, Shekon? Sego. Sego. Sego, yeah. Okay. And that's uh, greetings, you know, like how you doing, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how you say thank you is Nyawin, right? Yep. Nyawin. Uh, yeah. Um, through all our, um, our Haudenosaunee people, there's um, basically like uh, five different ways you can say it. But Nyawe is basically the uh, universal term for thank you. And it means a lot of different things. Like um, instead of Sego, you can say Skano. And that means good. Or, you know, um, everything is, it's a really big word. Like it, it has this like big meaning. And that's like basically what we can uh, boil it down to is just the word good. You know, everything is all good. Sego, you know. Um, like when people meet each other, they say, oh, scan out, um, Nyawa scan out. And then when you put those two words together, like Nyawa and good, it means I'm thankful you are well. Sego, I love it. Thank you for that. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, what you can do with the application is you can translate the whole thing into um, your own language, basically, where you put in your own, you know, text so that all parts of this application is translatable. And I... I think that's really one of the things that makes it really valuable for, especially for communities that are sort of revitalizing the language where there's been a little bit of loss and there's an effort being made to teach the younger people how to speak the language. So it can have that purpose as well. But also in the Amazon, you have communities that don't actually speak English or Spanish or Portuguese. They only speak their own language, right? And so that's why we, we made it so that you can translate it into um, any language. So, what I did after our conversation yesterday and after we uh, sat down and spoke with uh, Chief Arvo Looking Horse and heard some of the stories that he had to share is we, I put together a basic map in, uh, for Terra Stories where um, what you see here is what I did. The first thing I did was I took, I took off the sort of the settler name so that you don't see anything like uh, Canadian or the United States borders. I made it so that it's just Turtle Island and just a few place names just as an indicator of where you are. And this is something that, you know, you can customize, you can add your own place names. Once you have that all mapped, it's very easy to put that into the Terra Stories application so that you represent the data how you want, you want to, you represent the maps how you want to with um, the place names that are important for you. But for now, what I did was I basically just um, have an area that is representing um, the Sioux lands and then the Haudenosaunee lands. And this is data that I took from the website Native Land which is uh, also a Canadian-based uh, project to sort of enable people to learn whose land you're on, especially for settlers that want to do land acknowledgements or want to learn about 
native lands generally. It's a website where you can kind of search your own address and figure out whose land you're occupying. And so this is data from that website. So you see here the extent of, um, of Sioux lands of the Lakota as well as of the Haudenosaunee there. And yesterday we did some recording with uh, Chief Arvel, a uh, looking horse who we'll hear from in a little bit, where he shared us a few stories about, um, about uh, Chief Crazy Horse and a camp that he had, where um, he, which is very, uh, located very closely to Chief Arvel's house and also of a, of a Lakota sacred site. So what we did was we recorded um, Chief Arvel Looking Horse telling those stories and then we recorded where they, where those places are, those sacred sites. And then I put them on the map in Terra Stories so that we can actually um, zoom in on those places and, let me see, and listen to the stories. So the way that the application works is you can also kind of filter through the different stories. So you see here at the top left, you can actually, um, for example, select a region. So on the map that I just showed you, you had both the Sioux region as well as the Haudenosaunee region. So I, what I did in the application here, and I'm, I'm showing screenshots, you know, we can do a live demo at some point later. Um, I filtered down to the region of the Sioux. And so then it zooms in on where those stories are located. So in this case, it's just showing the stories by uh, Chief Arful Looking Horse. And you can also filter by the speaker. So that's what you see there that I filtered his story so that you only see the stories uh, of a certain person. So if you want to only listen to that person's stories, you can filter it in that way as well. And then this is really sort of the magic of the application is that when you click on one of the, the points on the map, you can see you can show a picture of that location and then it really shows you the stories that are related to that place on the map. So this is a, um, as we learned yesterday, this is a Sioux place called Mato Tipila, which is um, in more like the, the European settlers, they gave it a different name, which I think is uh, Devil's Mountain or something like that. And it's Dad, Dad, did you want did you want to talk about a little bit about the story of Mato Tipila? Yeah, we can actually hear the story now. This Chief Arvel is with us today. Oh no, Dad, you're on mute. You're on mute, Dan. Okay, I hear you now. All right. I'd like to start by saying that uh, you no know, blessings and greetings to all of you. And I. Uh... You want me to introduce you first, Dad? Yes, Gwen. Okay, so um, hi everybody <laughs> again. But this is my dad. He is the nineteenth generation keeper of the white buffalo calf pipe, um, which is a pipe that was brought to our people 19 generations ago and by a spirit woman. Um, he's gonna tell the story about that. And he's the keeper of the pipe. Um, and it's significant because that pipe was, is the first pipe that was brought um, ever to our people and she brought also the seven sacred rites and um, and our way of life um, to our people and um, she there's a real there's a big story that goes up behind it and I think he's just going to share that one because it has to do with um, Mato Tipila and I think do you want me to say anything else? <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say uh, blessings to all of you out there. And I'm uh, in our Dakota territory. That's what they call all, all of our uh, Ocheti Shakoni, our territory and goes up to Canada. So the census that they're doing today, like today, uh, that the Navajo Nation is the largest in the US and the Great Sioux Nation is the second largest. But if you 
uh, include the people in Canada, no, we, we are the largest uh, nation and we have relatives all across uh, uh, from East Coast to West Coast and uh, the Six Nations, we had the Tudlo Oyate, the Tudlo, uh, they speak uh, Siouan and all across uh, different parts of the states, uh, they all, all the way to uh, New Orleans, I uh, know they have a Mar Mardi Gras and they wear our uh, uh, bustles and feathers. And, well, uh, isn't the Tudalo, the Tudalo is significant to this territory in Six Nations because um, they had lived in this area. Yep. And they were adopted into the Confederacy. Yep. Into the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And they were Sioux, which a lot yeah. of people don't know. They spoke a Siouxian language. And we adopted from the Tudalo um, the. Um, I'm pretty sure it was our uh, Wasase, and they come from a lot of different people. And there was um, one man who was over a hundred years old, who was a part of our uh, council, who was basically at every council and they always referred back to him for different types of, um, uh, basically like a record keeper because he has such a good knowledge. But yeah, back to uh, Orville. <laughs> Yeah, so we have relatives all across the, the countries and uh, all the way into uh, South America, and which uh, we talked about earlier that uh, we still made relatives there. But it was just uh, we as uh, First Nations and uh, Indigenous people, you know, we, this is our original you know, land here and what are you all talking about uh, sacred sites and the rivers you know we have uh, all of our uh, in our territory we have all of our uh, rivers you no know, they they have a very spiritual name before the Washington you know takes the path came and into this territory into our land here Prior to that, uh, we have our uh, sacred sites and doing our ceremonies. Uh, they gave us a freedom of religion in 1978, but uh, we, it's not a, our way is not a religion. It's a way of life. And that's the way that uh, we do our ceremonies and with the sun, the stars. And we have so much uh, history and knowledge about our the stars now, in, in uh, the star knowledge, and the star knowledge, uh, uh, it's like a mirror and uh, our sacred sites. So we have uh, all of our sacred sites uh, getting back to uh, there was tower. That's where the Chanupa was brought, the sacred pipe was brought. And this is where uh, the the uh, the spirit woman, uh, the Sami, uh, by both the cap woman, brought this Chanupa, the sacred pipe. So from that time, you now till today, nineteen generations. I am the nineteenth generation, the sacred bundle keeper, and and close to Devil's Tower, that's where uh, the the people were camped. And, and a lot of uh, people, you know, go back to these sacred sites. Uh, the sacred sites, uh, that I've been uh, all my life uh, talking about the sacred sites. Uh, it's like a church, a school, uh, a place of worship. And this is uh, our sacred sites. And so we have many stories, but uh, all the tribes uh, across the uh, 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 U.S. Uh, they, they they recognize the uh, this uh, place as a uh, Matkotipula, the Bears Lodge, 
And there's a story that uh, when you go to uh, visit our uh, sacred place, the Devil, Devil's Tower or Matkotipula, you know, they never really had that uh, story till uh, recently too you know, about Matkotipula. Uh, so the we uh, never had a like uh, in this country. Uh, they wiped out our, you know, it's like a Holocaust or massacres that's going on that happened to all indigenous people and many uh, tribes were lost. They, they were wiped out. And anyway, today, you now we're still surviving as a First Nations and always in the for forefront of uh, progress in the name of progress. You know? And they use a uh, church and uh, boys' school. I was in the last stage of the boys' school and on the reservation. These reservations were concentration camps back in the 1800s. See, a lot of changes happened in the last 100 years, over 100 years. And those of you that you know, I think, I uh, know, 100, uh, over 100 years is not very. Uh, uh, for this, uh, when uh, our people were, uh, and uh, I speak a lot about the uh, environment, the way that we live in, you know, a lot of our uh, Monsanto today, and all of our rivers have been poisoned, and uh, we're, we're faced with uh, uh, the pipelines and uh, fracking, and it's a very uh, dangerous uh, place uh, to live in today. The, all the poisons that uh, were uh, in our, that's in our food, and uh, a lot of shots uh, that was given to you know, indigenous people, and we don't believe in that uh, because our, we have our own medicine. So I grew up. Uh, since uh, I've been a, a leader for our people since the age of 12 years old. I became the bundle keeper, a nacha, a chief, and I speak uh, fluent language, and I, I know all the ceremonies. So the state gave me an honorary doctor degree uh, because of uh, the knowledge, the sacred knowledge. And today, uh, you know, a lot of my elders that uh, I grew up uh, in that time, they're all gone. And today, you know, we went to the United Nations in the early 90s and I, I met a lot of old elders there. And most of them uh, are all gone except uh, foreign lions, you know? and, and a few, um, Gray Smith, Yellowhammer from uh, Navajo Nation. So these are all these elders that uh, went there talking about the environment and you know, that Mother Earth is sick and has a fever. And that was the same year that uh, the scientists came out with a statement called global warming. But uh, our way is uh, unwritten, uh, or it's oral history. Uh, we have a lot of uh, history, and a lot of our uh, place of worship and uh, the Manui Choni, the water of life. So we took a stand at Stan Rock and that's what we uh, shared with the people that you know. Today, you know, what is happening right now is uh, not good. With uh, what we hold in the ceremonies is uh, with the water. Every ceremony, you know, we have water. We have our spiritual medicine, but you no, know, it's it's affecting uh, our ceremonies. All this uh, this uh, Western. Uh, uh, disease, which we call Wawaza Khanka, Makak and Chigihapi. No, they have a big sickness here that come, came upon upon us now. And this uh, big sickness is uh, not affecting us uh, uh, as uh, families. And in our way, when one person is sick, you know, it, it affects the family and it affects the nation. 
And so uh, we are trying to, uh, you know, go against uh, everything that's going on right now. And right now they're taking stand against uh, the pipeline. And we set up uh, borders here and on the reservation to uh, keep the people from bringing the uh, COVID-19 in. It's a virus, a, a big sickness. But these are all in the prophecies that uh, I grew up with uh, knowing about the our sacred bundle, our prophecy, and that someday the white animals shall be born. That will be at the crossroads, either be faced with a lot of chaos, disasters, tears from my relatives' eyes. We're going to see a lot of earthquakes, volcanoes erupting where it never erupted, uh, happened before. We're going to see a lot of sickness, global disasters. No more on the board wars. We're going to see a lot of anger, a lot of hatred. Brothers and sisters will be fought, fighting. We see a lot of false prophets. We're going to see great changes and becomes the norm. People will be accepting these changes. So these are you know, all in our prophecies because we see uh, false prophets, uh, false leaders, and that's happening now. And that's why a uh, you know, long time ago, a leader is uh, takes care of the family, takes care of the <clears throat> nation. And uh, it's, uh, the wealth is uh, with uh, working with the uh, medicine and the, the health of our people. That's our, our uh, well-being, health and well-being. So- Dad, you talked about um, leaders and do you wanna talk about how our lineage goes back and how Crazy Horse um, was hiding in the story that you told yesterday? Yes. Uh, Crazy Horse was a Tashinko with Go. Which I shaki le lila wakanaha, lila wash aka. He was a very uh, powerful man and always in ceremonies. And he believed that uh, you know, to live freely, uh, no, no uh, treaties to be signed. And he shared a lot, a lot of people uh, know of Crazy Horse. And what I spoke of yesterday was that Crazy Horse uh, in his time back in the 1800s, uh, he uh, was all over uh, our, our territory and then you know, tried to protect our territory. And up uh, where the sacred pipe was brought uh, to uh, green grass, our community uh, back in the 1800s. And it was like a very uh, huge camp, a lot of uh, teepees all along the river. It's a beautiful river. And there's so many camps that was there, people camping and they want to be around the, the sacred bundle because this is a big, like a big city back then, you know, thousands of teepees. And anyway, uh, Crazy Horse said, uh, he would come to the sacred bundle. And one of the last times that, uh, the last time that he camped was uh, five miles west of uh, green grass called Makasha Wakba, uh, Red Earth Creek. And so I grew up, uh, listening to the elders talk about uh, this uh, place where Crazy Horse camped and him and uh, his uh, riders uh, is uh, uh, security, you know, they, they put, came to the, to the sacred bundle and uh, Crazy Horse uh, filled his chanupa and he prayed there at the sacred bundle. And when I became uh, 12 years old, 
uh, these elders told me about the stories of Crazy Horse. And I, uh, uh, it, he said, we're living a very dangerous time when I became uh, the bundle keeper. You can't talk about the sacred pipe or you can't talk about your grandfather. His name is Looking Horse. And the elder said, someday you're going to know about your great, uh, your great, great grandfather, Looking Horse, in time. But now you just uh, stay with uh, the sacred pipe and you can't use fall language. Uh, you know, you can't. Uh, join the military or you know raise your hand under the united states flag i never did this is uh my life as a medicine spiritual leader bundle keeper i never uh, i stay with our will play the laws of the chanupa the sacred pipe and so crazy horse no he uh came to green grass then he, he was camped west of uh green grass five miles west and then from there, he left towards uh, southwest, towards the uh, Black Hills. And he, uh, when he was camped uh, towards that way, he told the people, he said, Let the Akuhe Lila Waham let Hanka Hacha Bullahai Law. He said, As I said, I have a big dream. No, it was very sad. I saw the future. When I saw the future of our people, it was very sad. It was, it was really a uh, dark time. And uh, it was very sickly and people were having a hard time. And then it said, even got worse where you know, how the disease has affected the people. And way at the end there, he said, I saw a tree. Uh, I saw that uh, sacred tree and all these people standing there in a circle and all nations, all these people, all different nations are standing there together under the sacred tree. That's what, that's what I see. Then he said, uh, yeah, the, as he told a story, you no, know, the people, you no, know, saw that and his tears came to his eyes when he spoke to the people and they never seen that before anyway after that he he uh, turned himself in and you know who uh, rode with him all along was looking horse looking horse was his bodyguard or his right hand man of crazy horse and so now all these docu documentations and uh, like uh, all the history that was told by the mil military and the written uh, documents that were shown of Crazy Horse, uh, Looking Horse was uh, the right hand man. And they taught that in Chicago right now in, uh, in uh, the University of Florida. They're the ones that contact me and so we got Today we have all this evidence. Anyway, uh, they rode together to Fort Robinson and Fort Robinson, Crazy Horse, uh, no, he was uh, stabbed in the back. But one of our own people, jealousy. And then, you no, know, Looking Horse was there. And anyway, that's uh, our family's that we couldn't even talk about uh, Looking Horse you know, back in the uh, early 1900s <laughs> when I was uh, a young man, you know, as uh, even my age at the time, they, they say, you know, we have, a, we have to post security to have ceremonies and you can't talk about your grandfathers, you can't talk about you know, the sacred bundle. And it was really hard. It was a very dark time for me. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, I, uh, today I share, I get to share, you know, because these are uh, things that, uh, you know, are, is on, unwritten, that are our history. But now people are, you know, we have uh, 
different ways to uh, understand all this uh, history that was uh, that came together, you know. So I, I want to you know share that with you today because you know we are taking a stand today as a. Uh, so we're still we start we still are in the front lines of uh, what's happening in the in the name of progress. No, this is what's happening. So that's what uh, we we're, uh, we're here to uh, uh, like standing rock. That many we twenty. No, we we that uh, after we left standing rock, uh, the whole world you know, is uh, standing with us, uh, protecting the water. And now people are standing up for their rights. You know? This is uh, what's going on in the cities right now. And anyway, uh, all the abuse that's happened to our people is not happening to everybody. Not those, those they see what uh, has happened to our people today. You know? So a lot of our people have been wiped out by uh, sickness, uh, disease, uh, and a lot of our tribes are all totally wiped out. Mm -hmm. But uh, today, the, we have our, uh, every story have two sides. There's a written side and there's an oral history. And so we got that uh, uh, oral history and that's what I, I said that all this, uh, the rivers and the creeks and all these mountains, they, the, sacred places, they all have a traditional name. Even uh, when if you go across the border uh, uh, to uh, Mexico, no, they call it uh, that place Teotihuacan. That's, uh, that's our uh, sacred place too, you know. Uh, anyway, we, we share our language, we share our sacred places and this is uh, all these places. Uh, and I'd like to share one thing about Crazy Horse. To me, he was the greatest environmentalist. And I, I, you know, I share so much about his uh, work because uh, he uh, didn't, didn't uh, that he uh, took uh, life very sacred. He, uh, respect the water, the medicine, and our way of life. So that's the way uh, our, when you do that, no, you're, you're a leader for among our people. Uh, so Crazy Horse, uh, in that dream he had, you know, and, and he foresaw with that, that tree of life. And in our ceremony, that tree of life, you know, we have the Sundance tree, but we fasted for four days, uh, no water, because uh, during that four days, we respect that water, that many we choni. And in our bodies, you know, our heart looks like a tree. All these rivers, creeks, and streams looks like a, a tree that goes into a, a tree, tree trunk. And all of us, have that a heart. So we speak from the heart and we do things from the heart for uh, this sacred way of life here because we're connected to the uh, Chibmaka, Mother Earth, she's a spirit and our traditional medicine. That's our, uh, every territory, you know, they have a, their medicine to really uh, do a lot of healing. Anyway, uh, the Black Hills from the satellite view looks like an open heart. And all these rivers and creeks and streams uh, looks like a, uh, an open heart. And the satellite view from uh, the North America, uh, the, we talk, uh, say US or uh, today, but no, it's North America, it's a very sacred land here. But from the satellite view, uh, all this, uh, it looks like a tree. All the rivers and creeks and streams goes into the Mississippi River and, and then goes down towards uh, the Delta 
and the New Orleans. So it's like a tree uh, all that uh, we, all these names are rivers and creeks that have a, the, a traditional name. And mm -hmm. this is our, our medicine. This is where they grow. So you know, I, I grew up uh, in those times when uh, they made all those dams and you know, you had the map up of the of where Crazy Horse had hidden the um had hidden. Did he hide the chinupa there? Where you were talking yesterday, where it looks like a bird, or where he's just hiding there? No, that's where uh, he was camped. Yeah, so that's where that's what we had the map up of the water, and um, that's why that was up. Yeah, that's what uh, I was talking about, the, the camp. That's west of uh, Greengrass. Yeah, and we had the map up of uh, Mato Tipula, yeah. and where um, the bundle was brought to the people. Yeah. And, um, and the Black Hills is also like another sacred, sacred place. And um, do you want to like let them know that because our land is so sacred, we have the Black Hills that has 1.7 billion in treasury trust for the Black Hills and you won't accept the money? Yep, uh, up to this day, uh, the Black Hills is not for sale. We'll never accept that money. Yeah, so we have a lot of um, sacred sites and there's um, a lot for that is not for sale. And we have a lot of them here in Six Nations too. And I think that um, we're going to transition onto our next speaker, Girdo Deer. And thank you, Dad, for sharing all of your knowledge. Yeah. Well, one more thing is like, uh, right, uh, all these sacred sites are all lined up, uh, you know, different places. It's, uh, and when the uh, Europeans came here, you know, all of our sacred sites, uh, they made uh, the gathering places, they made them into cities, mm -hmm. and uh, well, the White House and you know, United Nations and all these. So a lot of our sacred sites, uh, uh, they they came and uh, no 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 it's uh it's uh, more of a conquering divide you know? they don't want to uh, I guess uh, put a uh, like uh, they they owned it you know? that, that that's the way they they want to but no to us uh, we're still it's it's our sacred place. And we're still going to do our ceremony, so we're still going to continue. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I hope uh, all, all of you, that you, even you, uh, Makasha, and then everybody out there, the young people can, that we're still here, and you know, we still uh, uh, have this, uh, this knowledge uh, of our people. I hope. Thank you. Yahweh. Yahweh. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a devastation with our like devil. It's called Devil's Tower when it's a sacred site, and just like Mount Rushmore, that's mm -hmm. a sacred site, and they put people who have done terrible things to the um, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota nations, um, and they they're the ones who made residential schools. And he mentioned that he was the last um, person. And that's my father who went to residential school. So it's not that long ago that residential schools have been, have affected us. It's not my ancestors. Like, no, it's my father that went there. And it's other people's who they're still walking around and they still have, it's not real old. Residential schools aren't real old. Like the last one closed in 1996. And that's the year that you were born. Yeah. Um, 
a lot of the uh, education that still goes on in the schools today, they call them public, public schools now, but a lot of the education is still in play. They don't teach us about our own people. They only have a little section about our people and we're seen through a third person point of view. So we're seeing ourselves outside of ourselves. And that was talked a lot about in our own um, uh, teachings back in um, at uh, Longhouse. They say that there will be a time where you'll be looking on the outs you'll be on the outside looking in. And that's the point where you'll be fully assimilated into um, coloni uh, colonizers um, way of life, basically. And you will have to relinquish all of your rights and all of your lands and all of that um, that we held in a high regard and that that was our wealth back then. And that's exactly what um, we're here today standing against. We're fighting against that. We're still alive and we're still fighting against um, colonizers and assimilation and society. Modern society is what they call it today. And it's not really modern at all. It's the old way of doing things, old way of conquering and dividing us and making sure that we are susceptible to their own um, will, basically, that they can take our, uh, what we used to call sacred, what we still know is sacred to this day, because there's been a small group of people that held this uh, knowledge, like Orville himself. And um, my good friend, Gerdo Deer, who uh, helped me with all of this research and actually helped me uh, bring a lot of this uh, information out of myself and into the public view and into our own community. So with that, I would like to introduce um, my own guide, um, Gerdo, or Gahanta Gerdo, uh, dear. And he is a uh, ecological, uh, ecologi ecologist at uh, Guyana State. And he was also one of our cultural tourism guides. And he did a lot of um, uh, medicine walk tree identifications. And he helped me um, with a lot of um, explaining and sort of uh, being able to convey my own um, thoughts and uh, ways of thinking into the modern uh, society. So Gerdo, could you uh, introduce yourself just a little bit more and uh, a little bit of background in uh, your work? Welcome to the show. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. And also, Gail. Kind of give me a guess. Well, I guess everybody knows me as Gary, but um, that's the nickname uh, from my full name, I'm Gary Mohawk. And I just introduced myself in case you want. Because I guess uh, a lot of our families are, are bi uh, bilingual or trilingual or whatever in Six Nations. Um, yeah, so I currently, uh, well, currently I'm on parental leave, uh, looking after um, our uh, baby. He just turned seven months, and uh, so I'm I'm off for now, and and uh, um, but I'll be returning uh, in the fall time back to Guyana City. So currently, um, I technically work for uh, the Oklahoma Skills and Trades Training Center. Uh, I am the cultural coordinator there. Um, and it's just, it was just a shift in, in titles um, to something to do with funding. <laughs> uh, but I am still based at, Six, at uh, Guyana, Guyana City here in Six Nations, and I still uh, develop tours and um, uh, some of the programming we do with, with different groups uh, that come to, to the site. And can All you guys right. hear me? <laughs> <laughs> but we can't really see you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Get better connection. Uh, I can try. Just give me one second. You need to stand on a roof or something. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to sit outside because it's a nice evening, but yeah, I have to run back to the Wi-Fi. Just uh, hear the baby screaming in the back. <laughs> Uh, well, congratulations on your baby anyway. I didn't really get to fully congratulate you on uh, becoming a man finally. Just kidding. <laughs> Can you hear us still, Gerdo? Are you, are you still there? 
Yep, I think we definitely can't hear or see Gerdo now. Okay, there he is. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Happy dog time. <laughs> so I guess... Um, we'll uh, I, talk the terror stories uh, back at Six Nations and uh, back at... Um, Chiefs Woods. We'll start with Chiefs Woods first. Okay, Chiefs Woods Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Chiefs Woods Park is uh, um, located on the north uh, shoreline of, of the Grand River on the northern, northern end of uh, Six Nations Reserve. Um, and the reason why I included uh, Chiefs Woods Park um, is because it's a place that has public access. And so one of the things that um, I've experienced in trying to run programming and, and teach uh, not only our own people, but visitors um, about our connection to, to the land and, and to the plants and, and to the river is that we don't have um, a lot of public access in our community to, to these places. And so Chiefsu Park is, is one of those places that uh, we can we can access as, as a community. And um, there are some interesting ecological features um, there that um, we can see. So uh, the Six Nations of the, of the Grand River, um, again, is what we re refer to it as, uh, is part of the Carolinian Forest Zone. And um, so the Carolinian Forest is a uh, forest type or e eco type that um, is associated with uh, plants that are that are um, on the southernmost point of, of Canada and, and Ontario, and so that big uh, green uh, um, square you, you see there that's that's uh, actually one of the largest tracts of Carolinian forest in Canada right now, uh, and so. It's, and it's at risk because, because our population here in, in Six Nations is the largest um, First Nations population in Canada and, and it's growing uh, year by year. It's been growing now for um, quite a few, like a few decades. Um, and so we are, are at a point where we're having to um, basically uh, utilize the, the forest zone to, to live and, and to, to expand our, our, our homes and for our, our children and uh, people who are uh, young, like you know, people in their in their twenties and my age, who are in their thirties, are uh, needing space to to build houses for their families, and so the the forests here are are suffering because of that. And um, a lot of it is, like I said, private land, um, and doesn't we don't have a lot of public access that we can see these these forests and and connect to them. And so, Chiswood Park is is one of those places. Another place um, adjacent to, to the park or across uh, Highway 54, um, I think was pinned on the map as well, is, is um, Six Nations Tourism, uh, which also has a, a nature trail. It's uh, one of the, I think two, I think we have two main nature trails in Six Nations that we can access publicly. And, and uh, so that, that's one of them. And uh, so it's a challenge for, for us or for me uh, to develop programming and to, to bring people out onto the land is because um, where we have access to a lot of times is, is agricultural. You can see all of the agricultural fields surrounding Chiefswood Park um, and Guyana State, which is actually just down the road, is an old agricultural area and it's that's um, modern agriculture. Um, what, what, what we also refer to as industrial agriculture. And so it's just a patchwork of, of forest and, and um, agricultural fields. And uh, Chiefsu Park uh, also has a, a good um, selection of, of native trees um, that are associated with the Carolinian zone. So the Carolinian forest is, ident is um, identified by the, uh, the, uh, what the type of plants and trees that occur here uh, indicates that we're connected to a southern more of a southern uh, forest zone. And as you go down across the border um, into New York State, Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, you, that's where you see a lot of the species that grow um, in southern Ontario. Uh, you see those occurring uh, more, more and more as you go further south. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so in Chiefsu Park and uh, Six Nations of Tourism um, are places where you can see trees that belong to the Carolinian zone, things like the shag bark hickory, the black walnut, um, uh, hackberry ha- trees. I to say it has a lot of our uh, indigenous plants there too at the greenhouse because it's not yeah. just a cultural um, uh, sort of tourism. It's also a uh, greenhouse and that keeps a lot of the seeds there. And we have the seed exchange as well. And when does that happen again, Gerda? The seed exchange, can you hear me? What happened to our sound here? There you go. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, Guyana State, um, where our operation is based, is an ecological restoration company. And so that, that's actually where I started. Um, I started working in the field, planting trees and, and uh, gathering seed from wild trees and plants and grasses, things like that. Um, and we, we go to places that are disturbed by uh, construction or, or um, large scale projects and we go and re- restore portions of those places that, are, that have been disturbed um, by planting trees and, and applying native seed and trying to bring it back to something that, that resembles a native habitat. Uh, another um, uh, type of uh, work that we do is invasive species removal. So we have a lot of invasive species in, in our community and in, in the surrounding area. Uh, so, um, so we, we work to, to try to limit those in the areas where we're um, planting. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot to, Over the lot course to talk about. Of years, yeah. Over the course of the years you've been working there, how many uh, trees do you think you personally planted? <laughs> Personally? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I, start, I started in 2007 and uh, we were planting not only trees, um, but uh, grasses and herbaceous plants. and. Uh, we're also doing nuts and seeds, so like acorns, hickory nuts, those type of things. So, uh, phew, if I were to add it all together, uh, it's it's probably um, more over three thousand, maybe closer to five thousand over the years, just with my own hands planted. There are places where I can go back and see some of the trees. Um, it's been over ten years now, and and they're uh, you know thirty feet tall. Uh, some of these trees I planted. So, yeah. I've, planted a forest by yourself <laughs> yeah pretty much I guess yeah <laughs> and I, um, I work there at Guyana State too we've also met a lot of people from all over the world and showed them how to uh, utilize our different techniques and a lot of our different culture uh, techniques as well like we did the uh, what is it the seed bombs with those uh, scientists um, from the conference and we did that with the uh, indigenous conference as well and they came from uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Kenya, um, people from um, uh, some people from Mexico as well, from Mexico City, and a lot of different types of Ongwehowe from all across Turtle Island. But uh, we're kind of uh, running short on time here, Gerardo. I know, and oh, yeah. we we really have to like um, cut it short. But if you want to know more about what Gerardo had. Um, had done, uh, you can uh, call him at Guyanese and visit the Guyanese website at guyanese.ca, right? Uh, yeah, you can Google Guyanese, you can Google uh, OSTTC Longhouse, we're on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, we're on social media. And okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. come out to the site, come visit for sure. Yeah, but we just uh, want to get the um, last part of our show um, going here, which is the conversation here. And we want to get the, um, if the audience is still there, if there's any questions for Gerdo, Rudo, or um, Arvel, um, you know, comment them in the uh, comment section. And, or if uh, Rudo has any questions for Gerdo, or if Gerdo has any questions for Rudo, um, you guys are able to talk to each other now, if you guys would like to. But in the meantime, I think it's a um, since it's about water, do you want to like say a little bit about the Grand River and their history with the Grand River and their relationship? With it? Oh, with me? It? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so 
um, our, our ancestral lands, right, are, are over in New York State, and, and um, we arrived in the Grand River in uh, 1784. We started making our way here into the Grand River because uh, because of the American Revolution and the uh, Clinton Sullivan campaign, and, and so that's how we ended up here in the Grand River anyway. And, and uh, we we established villages um, in in the lower reaches of the river uh, throughout the early 1800s, and and um, so. What we see, and when I've, I've spoken to archaeologists and, and um, some of the people from our community, is is that uh, the villages were were, were um, built and established along the river, and and um, they would uh, most of the time plant their crops uh, across the river. So these villages were living sustainably um, by growing the, our our, uh, our traditional um, corn, uh, um, beans, and and um, squash, sunflowers, uh, and other wild plants that we, we used in cultivation. And um, so that, that's a little bit of our history. And, and uh, when, we, when we look at the watershed, uh, we see that there's a lot of agriculture. And, and so there's been a lot of deforestation. And at one point um, in, the 19, in the 1920s, I believe it was down to about 5% of the original forest cover. Um, so during the uh, the uh, mid 1800s, um, a lot of the land was being leased off to to um, settlers from from Europe and, and uh, loyalists from from uh, the Americas, and uh, they they bring their uh, uh, Euro Euro American style of farming, which is to clear cut the, the land and and use all the wood and um, and mill in mills and, and to be sold off, and then they uh, drain all the wetlands and swamps, which actually keeps our river and and, and our our fishing grounds healthy um, to be converted to, to um, large scale agriculture. And so that's what we see still to this day on the map. Um, from what I understand, the forest cover um, over the past about a hundred years, 80 to hundred years has recovered to about 20 to 25%. And um, uh, so the, the, the aim is 30%. That's, that's considered a healthy forest cover for a, a watershed is 30%. And so, it's it's close. It's it's getting there, um, but as as we're getting closer to that landmark of thirty percent, we're also seeing a, an increase in in urban sprawl happening in the watershed as well. So there's over a million people in the Grand River Grand River watershed, and so um, a lot of uh, our community and a lot of the communities use the uh, the river, and so our, our historical relationship was that we came here and established sustainable villages along the river and, and utilize the surrounding area for hunting and, and uh, gathering uh, our food and, and um, uh, gathering sap to make maple syrup. Um, and a lot of that is passed down through oral tradition as well. So um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, history of our, of our exist existence in the Grand River. Uh, we, we do actually have native prairies as well. It's not just forest. Uh, so if you go to Chisu Park, there's also a native tall grass prairie that was established there in, in the, the early 1990s. And you can see some of the native grasses that occur there. So that connects us back to, to our, our, uh, our brothers in, in the West, um, our uh, um, Orville there and, and uh, you know, the, the grasslands that, that is part of their traditional ter territory also occur here as well. We, you know, we maintain the grasslands for hunting and, and the savannas for hunting um, just, just as they did there. And, and so that, that's a connection that, that we have with, with uh, the people in all across North, North America, the indigenous peoples that we, we had this relationship, we managed the, the land um, so that it, it could provide and, and, uh, and, it, and it benefited not only us as, as humans, but it benefited the, the animals and the birds and, and, our, um, and the, all of the ecology that, that exists there. And so you can go to Shusu Park and see all those, those things. That's why I, I pinned that um, on the map there. Yeah, do you, and it connects us to history. Seen, you, I mean, you know a lot about the environment situation. Do you know if you personally have you noticed any changes because of climate change and the um, like pollution effects on the environment in that area? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> um, well, it, there's a lot that happens in in, in nature that uh, so. In Six Nations, a part of our, well, not just Six Nations, but part of indigenous land use is, is to burn the fields down and, and to maintain grasslands with fire. 
And, and so we haven't been doing that because we have fire bans um, that have been affecting us for a, a few decades now. And um, that's affected the, the ecology. So we don't hear a lot of the species that we used to. Even when I was a kid in, in, in the early 90s, I remember hearing meadowlarks. The Eastern and Western meadowlarks uh, were common. And I remember hearing that call when I was a kid and, and now they're, they're still around, but they're not, they're not in as much abundance as they used to be because a lot of the grassland that was maintained is, is grown in or it's been reconverted to, to agriculture for growing tobacco, stuff like that. Um, and uh, thing, things that were really common just when I was, like I said, when I was a kid, like barn swallows, um, they're, they're actually a species at risk. Both of those birds are species at risk um, because we've changed the way that we, we interact with the land and, and uh, there's more pesticides being used. And so um, a lot of these birds are, are consuming insects in, in large quantities um, in the summer summertime. And they're migrating in from South America. That connects us down with, with uh, our people in, in South America because some of the birds that migrate here are coming from South America, the neotropical birds. And so uh, we're all connected to each other uh, through the ecology. Um, and so that, that's what I noticed is that some of the species composition has changed because of succession and, and um, overgrowth. And we're not maintaining those grasslands like we used to. So there were actually vast grasslands in our surrounding Six Nations that we used as hunting areas and would maintain with fire, oak savannas and, and uh, uh, tall grass prairie. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, pretty, uh, amazing. And uh, basically around here too, because our land is so developed and they've been colonizing here for such a long time, you know, that even those um, recent years, it's just been more and more amped up. And we've been losing a lot more and more of um, what things that we used to identify with as the coming of summer, spring, winter and fall and stuff like that. So, you know, Beardo's one of those old guys now. So just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, the river itself, another thing I notice is, is the amount of um, ice cover that we get in the winter is, isn't the same. The river doesn't freeze like it used to and the lakes don't freeze. And so we get these rain events and, and melting that happens throughout the winter and we have a lot more erosion happening on the river itself. And the, the banks have been eroding in the past two decades. Um, and so at Chesu Park, you can also go there and see we've lost a few feet of shoreline in the past maybe seven years due to um, flooding throughout the winter and and uh, massive floods that we're getting due to these large storms that, that are um, happening due to, I guess, climate change. It's really affecting the health of our, uh, our river as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you can tell that, you know, like uh, when you see things like that, um, it's just really like there's self-fulfilling pro uh, prophecies, you know, there's because there's not many people who really know that, lang uh, that old language and all those old knowledge anymore, so kind of sad you know but you know the the more bottleneck that information is you know the harder the people stand up you know the uh, the stronger those people are just like Gerardo yeah do you think that Matt, <laughs> like like to bring it back to Rudo do you think that if you have caught any of his presentation that mapping will help Six Nations uh yeah definitely because um when, you, uh, when you're mapping areas and you're able to identify or even get a baseline of, of what the habitat looks like now, uh, we can keep track of, of the changes that are occurring as the years go by and, and we can identify what needs to be protected and how, it, how it's important to us, how it's significant, significant to us, uh, whether it's medicine or, or um, has some kind of ceremonial value to us. Mm -hmm. Rudo, do you have any questions? For Gerdo and Gerdo, do you have any questions for Rudo? <laughs> for Rudo, uh, I really liked his presentation. I, I, it's a, uh, I've always had a fascination with with the people in in the, in the Amazon and in South America, and I think it's really amazing that he's he's actually been there and been able to work with them uh, and help them to to map their their territories. Uh, I, I've I spent a lot of time um, in my research. Uh, watching uh, whatever I can uh, as far as documentaries and, and information about um, the, the practices of the people and, and, and the Amazon. And it, and it is very much um, similar to, to the way that we grow our own food and, and historically grew our own food. Um, 
at Chusu Park. I keep mentioning it, but <laughs> there's a plant that grows there, Apios Americana. It's, it's like a wild potato, right? And and so we used to gather those roots and 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 plant those roots and those rhizomes in future village sites where we're, we're, we'd let it establish. And once we moved our village to that area, those plants would be gl- growing and flourishing. And I see that same practice um, in a lot of the research I've done in, in people in you know, South America, including the Jingo people he mentioned. That, yeah, that's right up my alley. <laughs> I enjoyed his oh. presentation. <laughs> Kero, I'm super amazed by your work as well, man. I mean, as you were talking, I was, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I was in the background kind of zooming in and out of Terra stories, um, partially out of pure personal curiosity, because I wanted to see the park that you were talking about with such like, um, such detail about the different plants and the different trees that you have planted in that area. And it looks like an amazing place that I definitely have to check out next time I'm at Six Nations. So a lot of respect for your work and everything that you've done. It's really sort of vital to keep the watershed healthy. Yeah, for sure. So Garrett, I'm curious, did you learn a lot from like your parents as well, or from like your family about the ecosystem? You build all this knowledge that you have about uh, like all this traditional ecological knowledge as well. Um, a little bit, yeah. My, my father was the one who introduced me to, to identifying trees and um, the, some of the historical and ceremonial knowledge that, that he, he learned throughout his life, he shared with me. And uh, I also went to school and, and learned uh, a lot about the, the, uh, the ecology in, in, in Ontario and Canada. And um, the more I learned about the scientific aspect and um, the more I was able to connect it back to what I learned from uh, not only my, my father and my mother, uh, but growing um, native crops or and, and how to utilize our, our own medicines and plants. So I also learned some of that from my, my grandparents, um, my grandmother used to make medicine and to talk about some of the plants and my grandfather uh, would be out with us when we were um, tapping trees to gather maple syrup he, he um, showed me a lot of the trees as well and so that's that's kind of yeah uh, where it started uh, and I've learned from other people along the way and and we've had a lot of uh, recording of information that's happened here um, in, in the past hundred years and I've been able to access that um, information that was uh, recorded in, in detail of what people were doing here uh, prior, to, prior to 1920 as far as uh, utilizing the land here in the water. Really impressive. Um, have you, um, have you, sorry, <laughs> I just want to know if um, you have any recommendations because our water, or I guess to Beardo, any recommendations on how like we can get our water healthy again because our uh, is so um, contaminated and so is Boston Creek and so is um, the Grand River and um, I know that it's going to have to be big changes and like getting all of the contaminants out of the water and all the contaminants that go flowing into the water but like I guess on a, I guess if it would be on a small scale, do you know I like any plants that um, fil- filter water? Uh, yeah, there, there's, um, there are a lot of wetland plants that play a role in reducing nutrients and capturing nutrients and also toxins as well, or, or contaminants. And uh, the, that's an area of study that I, I, um, I explored while I was in, in school using constructive wetlands to not only mitigate flooding, but also to capture nutrients uh, from agriculture and to reduce um, runoff from, from mining uh, industries and, and other uh, industrial industries. Um, so there are different, definitely plants out there that, that play a role in, in um, buffering some of the contaminants that can come into the water. Um, uh, what was the other part of your question? <laughs> um. Was that the main thing? I think that's the main thing yeah yeah um yeah and as far as uh, i think it was how can we sort of um help it or, or how, how can we contribute or i think one of the the main things that um i found is, is education like going out and actually learning what's living in the river so right from the the invertebrates and insects that live in the water like the mussels and, and the plants, identifying the plants and, and their relationship and the birds that are nesting there, when you can identify all of that and how it connects to where you live, um, 
it, you're more responsible to it now because you understand it a lot more. And, and so, you know, like for myself, when I was a kid growing up, I used to go all over the reserve and hunting and, and uh, uh, exploring the forest there along the river and, and the creeks. And I, I would find um, heron rookeries, so places where all the herons are nesting together. And, and that's actually uh, considered a provincially significant wetland when you, when you find that. And so I found those in the community. And um, those are things that I think um, as like the everyday person should understand and be able to identify. And once we have that understanding um, set into the community um, on a large scale, I think it would be um, better better equipped to, to question the developments and, and to question um, any sort of, uh, um, I guess, uh, large, large scale operation we're gonna do here in the community. Um, or even, even on a personal level, if you're building a house, what's the species you can save or what kind of trees can you establish on your property to help the wildlife? Stuff like that. Yeah, I think that could be a big thing that you just said, like mm -hmm. to make Question sure. Question even. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to make sure like our environment that we're building our houses yeah. or that we're. Just so we're more self-aware of like what we do each yeah. other ourselves. And that's the, it's really like where the accountabil accountability starts is self-acknowledgement uh, as to what you're doing to the world. And that's why we have the para stories as well. You know, so you're actually uh, more um, able to relate to the to the earth and to the land as uh, your own family member. Basically, that's why we call her Mother Earth. You know, that's why we call it. You know, um, our our cousins, our relatives out there. You know, the trees and all the medicines and all the animals and stuff like that. So, yeah, 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 thank yeah. you guys so much for all your knowledge. You both are super cool, and I bet you, if you ever met in person, if if Rudo ever came down to Six Nations, we mm. can definitely set up a lunch or a meeting or something. Yeah. You to... guys would be like the meeting of like, what was that guy's name? Sigmund uh, um, Freud, and uh, what's the other guy's name? The other philosopher where they talk for 13 hours straight. That would oh, be Carl Jung. <laughs> I need <mean>, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> you guys would be talking. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that Rudolph's coming back because we're going to be doing that uh, mapping here in Six Nations eventually. And um, I think Girdo can definitely come in hand for that, hand, hand you for that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, definitely. Oh, I'll definitely be back. I'm really looking forward to it and exploring the landscape again and just sort of seeing it with new eyes from everything I've learned today as well and just keep learning because. This is incredible and I'd love to and I'd love to keep involved in supporting the mapping and, and the whole process of land reclamation and you know figuring out where the water is polluted and how it um, aligns with the traditional knowledge of the lands as well. So and I'm really looking forward to meeting you Kerito, especially after today. Yeah definitely definitely. <laughs> okay, so, so, to you both. And, uh, so we're gonna wrap up and go to, go to the Amazon music video that we have for you guys. Um, thank you all so much. Oh, no. Alegria. Alegria. Só por cima. Só por cima. Só na frente. Só na frente. Muito. Muita gratidão. Tchau, tchau. tchau.
everybody for, for watching in. and yeah. you stayed the whole thing that is you're amazing awesome. and you're awesome and yeah. you deserve a free t-shirt uh if we get <laughs> when we get them in we'll send them out to you you know all those if you say the whole thing you're a trooper yeah we love you just use the hashtag or <laughs> we'll tag us in it yep let we'll us know a, how you liked it and if you. you have any questions still let us know in the comments and a special thank you to Catherine and Hannah, who are tech behind. Who are tech geniuses. Tech geniuses. Yep, yeah, here's the credits. And uh, thank I'll, you, yeah. everybody. Also to Orville once again. Yep. To and my dad, to Gerdo, to, to Rudo, Rudo, and all of our other guests and future guests. Thank you for tuning in. To Tune this. in next week for episode six. And next week. And is like our page like our page and next week is going to be more um uh more women, women. more women centralized so i'm not going to be here just kidding <laughs> <laughs> but all of our speakers will be women and they'll be awesome women they'll too. be awesome women okay oh, we always are yeah so it's going to be i tune in next week Anna. okay thank god all right